119. The Reversal of Standards Position Paper Number 119 March 1990 Over the centuries, as Christianity has advanced, counter-movements have arisen. With the Enlightenment, a major and lasting counter-movement began its history. And, although the Enlightenment gave way to Romanticism and a variety of other motifs, the anti-Christianity remained, but with a difference. The Marquis de Sade, waging unrelenting war against Christianity, rebelled against the idea of good and rejected it. This rejection became rapidly more and more vocal. Max Stirner, in The Ego and Its Own, expressed contempt for atheists who professed to have rejected Christianity but were still closet Christians because they did not practice incest. The death of God for him meant also the death of all ideas of good and evil. Friedrich Nietzsche called for living beyond good and evil. The conflict was not to be between good and evil, but rather, with both good and evil abandoned as false concepts, it was to be between moral and religious standards on the one side and, quote, freedom, end quote, to live in an, quote, objective, end quote, ostensibly non-moral realm on the other. Emile Durkheim, in terms of an evolutionary premise, saw the criminal as the evolutionary pioneer breaking new ground for society. One consequence of this change was that, very early in the modern era, the criminal became a romantic hero. The thinking which led to Rousseau's philosophy led, in literature, to the idealisation of the outlaw as one who represented a true state of nature. See Paul Angelillo, A Criminal as Hero, The Regent Press of Kansas, 1979, pages 32 and 33. In the 20th century, films popularised this idea greatly. Actors like James Cagney played the part of noble criminals warring against a hypocritical and evil society. In time, public sympathy was with convicts as against their guards. In 1989, a prison guard, Michael McLaughlin, with R.S. Steinde and Warren Jameson, wrote an account of prison life in an institution for hardened criminals. Screw, the truth about Walpole State Prison by the guard who lived it. Far Hills, New Jersey, New Horizon Press, 1989. The guards must wear rain gear on their rounds because prisoners, among other things, shower them with urine and feces. In any conflict, politicians, lawyers and courts side with the criminals. Murder by convicts is routine. Guards are regularly wounded. Narcotics flourish. So too does homosexuality. Mothers would openly copulate with their sons when visiting them, and sisters would pay off a brother's gambling debts by sexually servicing the creditor. Brutal murderers would regularly get furloughs. At every turn, the criminal was favoured, and guards and society became the losers. What takes place in prison is a paradigm of modern society. The death penalty for murderers is opposed, but unborn babies are murdered. The reversal of standards denies the validity of biblical morality and favours practices designed to undermine Christianity. Well, this should not surprise us. Modern humanism is logical and systematic in the application of its faith in a way that Christians are not. The humanist is a more religious man, usually, than the Christian, and more dedicated to his faith. A churchman usually holds his faith lightly, and he does not allow it to interfere with his lifestyle. He expects much from God in exchange for a slight profession of faith. 
If any Christian leader's preaching or writing troubles his conscience, he often reacts venomously. His concept of Jesus Christ is one who gives man various guarantees in return for an occasional nod to God and a pittance of giving. Many churchmen are as much, and sometimes more, of a problem to the faith than are its enemies. The advance of this great reversal of values is expedited by the, quote, conservative, end quote, intellectual, churchman, or, quote, agnostic, end quote. His perspective is one of a studied rootlessness. He advocates all kinds of, quote, traditional values, end quote, without calling attention to their necessary source in biblical faith. To admit to Christian faith is seen as alien to an intelligent discourse. The result is a curious one. In the 1920s, an old-fashioned liberal, H. L. Mencken, had a major influence. Mencken, in the name of intellectualism, did little more than attack bitterly Christians and Southerners. Since Mencken, a curious development has taken place. Southerners who aspire to status as intellectuals routinely damn the South to prove that they are worthy of status. Mencken, as an old-fashioned liberal, broke with the New Deal and F.D. Roosevelt. In the 1980s, his fall from liberal grace continued as it became known that he disliked both blacks and Jews. Mencken's influence, curiously, is alive and well in conservative circles. Imitation Menkenism gained its first revival in the National Review, then in The American Spectator, and later in Chronicles of Culture. All three are often of great interest. The writers are among the finest, and their issues are usually good reading. Their high quality makes their failure all the more distressing. They share in a common error. A studied rootlessness. Their thinking is in a vacuum. More than Christianity's enemies, they simply ignore its existence. The liberal and radical humanists take Christianity seriously and attack it strongly. The latter-day Mencanites act as if it does not exist or never existed. Some of them are churchmen, but one would never know it to read them. As a result, their work, often finely honed, witty and learned, is marked by a curious sterility. By their unwillingness to allow religion into intellectual discourse, they become trivial. Paul Tillich rightly defined religion as ultimate concern. The latter-day Mencanites live and think with trivial concerns. They do themselves the gravest injustice because their studied rootlessness invites a sad description of them. The intellectual as eunuch. By ignoring the religious nature of human concerns, they condemn themselves to a life of appearances, to a carefully cultivated irrelevance. Our liberals and radicals are indeed anti-Christian, but they are religious men earnest humanists. Too many churchmen are like the Laodiceans described and condemned by our Lord, neither hot nor cold, simply lukewarm. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 16. And too many conservative intellectuals have become abstracted from reality because of their hostility to the matters of faith. They read sometimes like guests at a Mad Hatter's tea party. It is no wonder then that a major reversal of morals and standards has long been underway. In the academic world, the disaster is far gone and a new reign of the dunces prevails. Charles J. Sykes rightly subtitled his Prof Scam, Professors and the Demise of Higher Education. Bregnery, Gateway, 1988 
Those who believe that an imaginary pendulum will restore moral standards are assuming that a naturalistic and mechanical factor is always at work. This belief is itself an evidence of the breakdown of standards. Restoration comes through God's judgment and grace and man's faith and work. It begins in us and with us. We put our lives, our faith, our time and our money on the line. There is no other way. The belief in a mechanical adjustment by a quote-unquote pendulum is to believe in a modern fairy tale. Civilizations have routinely perished and disappeared. No society can have standards when men lack them in all their being. Such a society does have peace in the grave. Our Lord and his law words have been treated with contempt by our culture. God will surely deal with all such men and nations. Why will he deal with us?